this whole thing when you dig down to it, situation awareness, I think, is the, the crucial concept of everything that we do. You know, where you get something like um, disagreement between two sources of information, well, I've just heard today a story of two patients, one um, for two different departments with a common waiting room, and on, as luck would have it, two patients with the same name. And the wrong one went to the wrong department and got as far as having bloods taken, but analysed for the wrong test. So the patient didn't realise, they're just doing what they're told to do. And it was only when they said, what are you here for? After they'd taken the bloods and the patient said such and such a procedure, they went, are you in the wrong place? Situation awareness is a mental picture of what is happening around us, as well as the implications of what is happening and what is about to happen. Situation awareness, or SA, is important because of how easily it can become upset or dangerously faulty. Simply explaining the definition of situation awareness is not good enough. So, firstly, we shall try and illustrate with this purely fictional ad for Silver, the navigation equipment manufacturer. There hasn't been a USS Montana since the Second World War, nor a manned lighthouse in the Irish Sea for several decades, and the US Navy must be about the most situationally aware organisation on Earth. Here is a situation we can all relate to. After work one evening, I went to the multi-storey car park where my car was parked. It was a tall people carrier with a roof box on top, so it was pretty easy to spot. I searched the car park from top to bottom and finally began to consider other options for getting myself home and informing the police that it had been stolen. However, the reason I couldn't find my car was that I'd driven to work in my husband's car that day. Now, my husband has a dark blue Subaru Legacy estate. I'd driven to work in his car. And what stands out about this situation is that I've been driving for 20 years, done 7,000 hours behind the wheel and driven over 300,000 miles. As an experienced and competent driver, this does not prevent situation awareness problems like this. I was not distracted, but concentrating hard on the issue. Now, my eight-year-old daughter, who has never driven a car, would have been just as qualified as me to solve the problem. So, where did it all begin? Situation awareness has been a familiar military concept for centuries, but the term is more recent. It was in the latter half of the 20th century when military aircrew were introduced to SA during training. Soon after, it entered the language of air accident investigators. In a large survey of aircraft accidents in which human error was to blame, nearly 90% were due to faulty SA. The result of this survey and subsequent corrective actions brought the term SA into everyday language of both pilots and air traffic controllers throughout the world. In the 1990s, the concept was adopted by psychologists, who applied it to the more general study of human performance and limitations. To illustrate SA-related adverse effects in medicine, we will look at a familiar type of error, namely the wrong diagnosis. These events took place in the early 1990s when there was a greater emphasis on X-ray examinations in the investigation of bowel disease. An eight-year-old boy presented to an accident and emergency department with a three-day history of worsening abdominal pain and mild diarrhoea. The first doctor to examine him was a junior casualty officer. They found non-specific abdominal tenderness without distension and mild fever. Blood tests showed evidence of an acute inflammatory reaction, high white count and raised erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR. The notes stated, possible appendicitis, but not typical inflammatory bowel disease, enteritis. The boy was referred to the paediatricians, who amongst other things arranged a barium enema. This showed an area of irregularity in the mucosa of the large bowel consistent with Crohn's disease. In a clinical meeting, the case was discussed and the radiologist deemed the diagnosis uncertain. 
A trial of treatment was commenced with the intention of reviewing the diagnosis in the light of the boy's response. Crohn's disease is an autoimmune condition in which the immune system attacks the body's own tissues, in this case, the bowel. Treatment is with drugs that suppress the patient's immunity, both their autoimmunity and their natural defence against infection. Treatment was started and the child appeared to improve for two days before relapsing. A second immunosuppressive drug was added. His condition stabilised over the next few days, then again deteriorated. A week after the first clinical meeting, the case was discussed again. The original plan had somehow been forgotten and discussion focused on how to manage the fact that he was not responding to treatment for Crohn's disease. Immunosuppressive treatment was again escalated and this went on for a total of three weeks with trials of different doses of different drugs. Surgical resection of the bowel is an option for the treatment of Crohn's disease that is not responding to other measures, but it's only done very reluctantly. This is particularly so in children because the procedure does not cure the disease, which may appear in other parts of the gastrointestinal tract and leads to a permanent loss of bowel and possibly a colostomy. In this case, there seemed to be no alternative, so surgical bowel resection was planned. The surgeon found not Crohn's disease, but appendicitis. After three weeks of immunosuppressing treatment with no antibiotics to control the infection, it was rampant. The worst case of appendicitis the surgeon had seen. Malignant melanoma is a form of cancer that originates in pigment-forming cells called melanocytes. It's received media attention because sunbathing and the use of sun lamps are risk factors. The eye contains a dark layer formed by melanocytes and this makes the inside of the eye a common site for malignant melanoma. It causes blindness in the affected eye and like other cancers, it is fatal if not controlled. The diagnosis of ophthalmic melanoma is made by ophthalmoscopic examination or on scans. The eye is often normal to look at from the outside. The condition is treated with surgical removal of the eyeball and later fitting of a glass eye. Now this operation was planned on a 52 year old man with a melanoma in his left eye, which had to be removed to save his life. He was already blind in the left eye, so the operation would not mean any additional disability. He was marked for the operation, then anaesthetized. In theatre, he was prepared and draped. The first drape covered the mark on his left eye. When the scrub nurse went to pick up the second drape, the stack of drapes fell to the floor. There was a short delay while a new set of drapes was opened. The draping continued, but around the right eye. Everything seemed calm and normal and stress levels were low, but the team was heading for a disaster. All doctors can recall cases like this. They start with a tentative assessment of the situation. The focus then shifts onto dealing with the situation as perceived without returning to assessment. If that assessment is incorrect, things can go badly wrong. Notice the parallels between this and the previous case. The problem is a mistaken mental model that the surgeons were proceeding with the correct eye. It arose because circumstances made the presentation of crucial information error prone. All remained calm in the theatre. The problem could have easily been corrected if it had been recognised in time. Two years previously, the medical director of the hospital became exasperated the second time the neurosurgery department drilled a burr hole in the wrong side of a patient's skull. He introduced a strict checking system to all theatres before any operation began. The scrub nurse, anaesthetist and surgeon were required to consult the consent form and imaging to confirm the correct operation was being performed. This was done and the error was realised. All it meant was that the surgeon looked green for a minute or two. Then the patient was redraped and the correct operation was done. A patient with an ankle fracture was having it manipulated and splinted under general anaesthetic at the end of a long orthopaedic list. 
Timescales were tight and the patient came to theatre in a wheelchair. To save time, the anaesthetist decided to transfer the patient to the operating table and anaesthetise her there rather than involve another transfer to a bed or trolley. The surgeon was called away before this decision was made. Whilst the anaesthetists were oxygenating the patient on the operating table, the surgeon reappeared and started to manipulate the ankle before the patient was asleep. Ouch! To reduce errors, we need to maintain accurate SA and recognise any errors in good time. To work out how to do this, various models of SA have been proposed. The commonest model is that of Ensley, or a variant of it. In this model, SA is divided into three levels. When SA-related mishaps are analysed according to this breakdown of levels, the overwhelming majority, 78% in one study, are caused by failure of perception or failure to notice clues. Fewer, only 17%, are caused by failure of comprehension or understanding. Least, 5% are caused by failure to anticipate. Since Endsley's model was introduced, the study of SA has been categorised into two areas. Personal SA, which is about how individuals gain and maintain their own SA, and group SA, which is about how SA influences the performance of whole groups. We will discuss Ensley's model again. In the meantime, we will turn to the principal tool for improving personal SA, called the triggered check.